Welcome to Every Way Woman. So there is a cost to everything, including the price tag on self-worth. I want to talk about what it is and what it's doing to our children and women out there. Stacy, you, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, it's you. What, I was like, I so I can kind of go by this. Specifically, uh, you are a woman who I look up to because I feel like you, you really, truly understand your self-worth. Thank you. Jennifer. And what does that look like? You know, I evolved. I want to be honest with you, I evolved. The Stacy that you see today is not the Stacy that was there before, and that will happen with all of us here. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I had to do um, was I had to be honest with who I am and be comfortable with what I bring to the table and stop trying to represent something that I was not. What do you mean, be honest with who you were? What well, is that moment? Okay, so for so long, because of my molestation, I really put a wall in front of me. And so what I did was I insulated myself to be the best at everything, be the cheerleader captain, so I was never in a vulnerable position. But yeah. you can only be a farce like that for so long. Well, and that's interesting because I think myself included and our children, we're looking to other women in the media in particular, right. and we're getting false impressions of who they really are. And I'm assessing my self-worth accordingly. I can only imagine what that's doing to a 12-year-old child. Well, learning self-worth and discovering what my own self-worth is, like Stacy said, is evolving. But what I'm starting to learn now that I have children mm -hmm. and they're growing and, and I'm learning things about them is that I'm learning that your child, my children at least, are teaching me their self-worth and how I can show them what it is. It isn't always mm. what I think it is. Well, or how, how are they teaching be. you? What are I they doing? That. Well, it's like with, with my, um, you know, sometimes when you have kids, it's not always um, like, oh, they're my baby and everything's wonderful and great. You have personality conflicts. Absolutely. And you don't always <laughs> like each other all the time. And I get an right? amen. That's right. Right. I love my kids. Amen. I love my kids. I love them, I but there are them. days when I'm right? like, You're like, who are out? you? And did you come out of me? Right. <laughs> so, right. But it's also what, what I was learning was is that my daughter, when, when she gets to be the boss, she feels like she has a lot of self-worth. Mm -hmm. And she started asking me as soon as she could talk. Those were the one of the first questions that came out of her mouth. If I had to go somewhere, she wanted to know, who's the boss of me, mommy? Right. Right? And I would say, well, you're the boss of you. And that and I started telling her she's the boss of her when I ran into a problem because then babysitters came along. <laughs> yeah, and the child, child, I, I the am boss, the boss of the me. Boss. You are not telling me what to do. I am the boss. But you know, Madison <laughs> makes an excellent uh, statement. And I think as parents, we have to know that we are the first teacher of self-value and self-worth. And I think what's happening now is because, as Madison said earlier, parents are outside of the home, we're surviving, we're feeling guilty. So instead of spending that time, we're buying them things. But we have to take time. What? Whatever Magazines? Else, whatever can I have quick fixes? P you know, PS3, twos, iPhones, cars. As opposed to saying, instilling value and truth in them. And teaching, I'm teaching my daughter, I have a 17 year old and a 15 year old. And I tell my babies all the time, I need you to be true to yourself. I'll give you a quick example. My daughters like to wear their hair natural. Mm -hmm. I was mortified that they wanted to wear their hair natural. You know why? why? Because I was afraid of what people were gonna say about me. Really? What people were gonna say about me allowing my daughters to have natural hair. What would they that, say? Because that's just not the way a young lady should look. And for a minute, I bought into that notion and I had to snap out of it and say, hey, these are two very beautiful young ladies. And so, and what they did was they wore it in an environment that didn't necessarily accept natural hair. Mm -hmm. That's why I was uncomfortable, not because of them, because they wore the natural proud, but because what people would say about me. We got to change that. It has to be. And I was proud that they were confident to do that. We instilled they are, something in yeah, them. Yeah, right. that was a beautiful and lesson for you, your children to teach And you. for me. And it's mm -hmm. self-worth. And I think so, and it's different for each child, right? right what right. each child's self-worth is. So when it comes to like the women in the media now that aren't real and that and you start comparing yourselves to these airbrushed do, they, remember, do you guys remember the you, there was a video that went out about a woman and they took a picture of her made her plane and then they started doing all of these things to her and by the end she looked like she was a 16 year old vogue model mm -hmm. of course okay so that's not realistic what they're putting out there but i think if if we uh, if we start to understand who our people our people are mm -hmm and we get to understand what their personalities are and how they feel loved and how they feel self-worth, and we teach them on their level, at right. their terms, there's a, then it doesn't matter. But there's a point about teaching the young, but I think there's something to be said about 
reteaching ourselves. Absolutely. I used to be so much more fearless and I believed in myself so much more to be completely candid. And then I got to this quarter life crisis, whether it be, you know, when you're 25 or 42 and all of a sudden that empowerment and that worth you carried so proudly through your parents and through these lessons right. when you were a child has withered away and, and you've become that to cheated. You, the society has done that to you because what we what we've subconsciously told you was that you're not enough because you don't have this or you haven't acquired that. And self-worth comes from the inside out. So I just don't know how to get it back. Well, if I can tell you what you have to do is you have to decide what Jeslyn wants. And it may not look like what Madison and I right. agree with, but you have to be okay with but it. But that, and that really does surprise me because, you know, I, the way that I see you, I see you as someone who's extremely self-confident. And beautiful. Yeah, and beautiful. <laughs> you have all these great uh, attributes about you. That I'm really shocked by that. And well, sometimes self-worth is not, you know, we, we think for it to be that it's external, but really self-worth starts here and it comes out. Let it shine, ladies. We'll be right back with more Every Way Woman. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you in every way woman? Are you in every way woman? I'll devil's advocate it. Okay. Welcome back to Every Way Woman. So let's chat about the book Extra Large Love, recently released by Sarah Varney. And in it, she tells the story of obese girls who are having riskier sex um, and they're taking more health risks because they're larger. You may, I mean, you made a face, Stacey. Yeah, that's tough. Um, Self-image, I can't say how important self-image is. And for a young woman who's overweight, who we've told her, because society would tell you, because she's not going to see anybody in a magazine that looks like her, mm -hmm. that she's not important, the first man who says the right things to her, she is going to absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely go and make her feel like she's important. But I don't, I don't think there's a point to that. And that would be any girl, any size, who's having issues of self-worth. You're right. And, yeah. and it's someone who's having issues of self-esteem, self-worth, which we were talking about earlier. Um, you're right. If you say the right thing, then yes, it, it will open up that girl to have risky sex at a very young age and become promiscuous. Um, I think it, the reason why it might be more of an issue with obese girls is there's no going around it. it when, you are, when you allow your child or if your child is obese at a very young age, they start to develop much faster Correct. than other girls do. You know, so I they, recently read that some girls who are obese are starting their menstrual cycles as early as ten. first or second grade. What? That early? I have that like 10 years early. old. I'm not first and second grade. <laughs> what? That well, early. If you're very overweight, you, that could happen to you. But wait a minute, let me, let me, because I want to make sure I'm hearing you two correct. So you're saying that even young women that are not obese, what, what was your point about? But I, I'm saying even young women who are not obese, but who are having issues with self-image, maybe they're too thin, maybe they're anorexic and they have issues with their body and they have this body dysmorphia and a man comes along and he makes them feel loved and makes them feel wanted. But they I think might. the difference is though society, we will be more embracing of someone who's thin than someone who is morbidly obese. So, oh, we but, take that no, across no, the board. Okay, but yes. So, Stacey, you're taking the point of society. If you are in the mind of a woman who is too thin mm -hmm. or the mind of a woman who is overweight, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. not about what society feels. That's about how they personally are feeling about themselves yeah. in that moment. Well, we we contribute let's, say, to let's, that. let's take that part out of it and we just focus on, let's say it is because it, it is the, ch the child is obese or the young lady is obese. And I think a big part of it is which we kind of glossed over a little bit, is that they're developing a lot earlier, as early as first and second grade. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's okay. huge. Mm -hmm. Okay, but aside from that, they're being developed earlier. They're getting poked on, picked at. The, how, can you imagine what the boys and the other kids are like at that age and what kind of things that they must say and, and to, to that young girl who's developed so soon? And then the kind of attention she's getting from boys who are two, three grades above them. I mean, how many third, fourth graders do you know that think about... Yeah, but... But okay, you know, but two years. And then you have the young. Then you have these young girls who are in their classes, and that's 
available to them. But I so wonder why are they making riskier choices? What is it because that it's already been laid out for them? Yes. That they're not worth it, so they don't no, have to use a condom fair, or be they're careful. They're having constant contact with it with, at a very young age, where and, girls are supposed to get it later when they develop in their teens. But if they're getting it before their teens, that implant has already been put in their minds. For, it's a seed that's been planted very early on age. And boys are promiscuous. Teenage boys are promiscuous. So they see these young, these women as an easy target. Oh, I can just, you know, I see Fat Susie and I'm going to get with her. That's one notch on the belt. Mm -hmm. And because Fat Susie is not valued, that's why I don't want us to dismiss what we do to that. I don't even Internally, we can do that. But, but I don't so know. they do. They just pick them out. But I don't know if it's just Fat <laughs> Susie, okay, well, I think it might just be Susie's got some tits. Okay. <laughs> so but also, that, you know? let's, let's yeah. not just say the girls, o obese boys too. Because you know, biologically, when you're heavy, the man part, which what? is referred to as the penis, shrinks. Oh my gosh. Right? Okay, so, I'm learning all kinds no, of stuff okay. with this. So, <laughs> no, you know what? Okay, let me give you a little right. shout on that. For every 50 pounds you're overweight, right. no matter your age, you lose an inch of your size. True story. So those obese young boys as well True. are probably feeling like, oh, you know what? Let me, <laughs> any type of relationship I can have. I'm because just going to do don't, this. Yes, I'm just going to do this because we, as a society, don't dismiss the job. We, fat. I work in HR. Let me tell you, somebody come in fat, we automatically make a judgment. So you can imagine a person What do you mean homework, you may automatically make a judgment? What do you make a judgment? that they're not disciplined. Mm -hmm. right. Disciplined. Interesting, because they're not being disciplined in their sexual life, nor are they being exactly. disciplined with their nutrition. So you got a person who's going through all these hormones and these feelings, and somebody rub up on it, and you're like, oh, you know what? You <laughs> that, <laughs> that is a real issue for them. And so now, nobody talks to them. They just figure, I'm going to just go out and have sex, and here's where we are. It's but horrible. I, it's interesting, though, because they're receiving the same kind of sexual education From as who? Right, the exactly. Rest. Have you, oh, well, no, but I mean, like, it, through this, one would assume. They show you a video in school. I, yeah, I know. That's all they book. do. I don't know. Your parents don't even want yeah. to talk about it. But the parents don't want to talk uh, about it. But it I, because the girls are maturing earlier, I think, because they're developing earlier, it, they're being approached at a much younger age. So they're more apt to be open to exploring. But yes, if you in take it in the face of... Enjoying their curves. <laughs> yes, but if you also take it in the face Wanting of... Wanting to feel loved. Of, of a, of a self-esteem thing too, then mm -hmm. yeah, maybe they will be willing to step out there and do things that most girls wouldn't do. They want to Ladies, be no matter your size, play it safe. We'll be right back with more Every Way Woman. Coming up next, more Every Way Woman. Are you in Every Way Woman? Are you in every way woman? Do you know the difference between breast reduction and breast augmentation? Neither do I, but stay tuned for the answer from Every Way Woman. Breast surgery is one of the most popular surgeries out there. Breast reduction, breast augmentation. And here we have Dr. West and Dr. Gown to tell us the difference between the two and also how some of the procedures are done. Uh, Dr. Gown, what is a breast reduction surgery? So those are bipolar opposites. The breast reduction surgery is when a woman comes in complaining about the overly large size of her breasts, causing issues such as back pain, neck pain, headaches, deep grooves from the bra straps, moisture that develops under the folds of the breasts, and they're coming in really from relief of those symptoms. We treat those just like any cosmetic surgery, but sometimes the insurance will cover the cost of that surgery to relieve those symptoms. And what it is is removing excess breast tissue and performing a breast lift at the same time to give the patient a more youthful look mm -hmm. and at the same time relieve your symptoms by taking away the weight of that extra mass. Okay. Now, what would be the breast augmentation? So breast augmentation would be the opposite. So a patient who comes in and she feels that she doesn't have large enough breasts. Um, sometimes it's a very straightforward procedure where we put an implant in and we have a lot of, as you can see, a wide variety of implants we can use. Sometimes it means putting an implant and doing a lift at the same time. So it really depends on what the patient needs. Okay, well, I've, you do have a couple of different um, samples here. So I'm holding a, a natural, uh, looks like it's smooth, and one that's a bit rough going. So what's the difference between these two? So what you're holding in your hands, there are both gel implants. This is a generation four implant, this is the generation five. Slight differences between the two, they're both gel. If I were to take a scissor and cut this one in half, 
it's not going to run all over the floor. It's got very, it's, it's not. It's like jello. Exactly, okay. it stays together. This one even more so, you can feel it, it's a little bit thicker. Yes. If I were to cut this in half, it actually, you can see that, that definite line between the two, it's built like a gummy bear. This is that gummy bear implant that you're hearing talked about in the news today. The different textures, this one's a smooth, this one has a texture to it. If you look at the side profile, one of them looks like an actual breast shape. It's shaped in a teardrop. Mm -hmm. The texture acts to keep it positioned on the chest so that we don't have problems with rotation. Right, yeah, so it, this doesn't end up at the top. That doesn't end up at the top or the side. That looks a little bit awkward, whereas the round doesn't matter. If it turns within the body, it maintains the same shape. Now, if, since this has a more natural look, would you think this, is this the obvious choice? Well, I think that what I find, I use a lot of the, the gummy bear, the, the implant that you're holding now, for reconstruction patients. So we probably use it in about 80% of our, our patients, and they really get a very nice uh, look after reconstruction. In cosmetic surgery, I would say it's not as uh, a big part of our practice. Um, most people these days are still using the traditional round implant, so it, but it really depends on what is the appearance that the person is trying to achieve. So for somebody who comes in and says, I want the most natural look I can possibly get with a very smooth transition where there's no roundness at all that people typically associate with implants, then you might go to the shaped implant. For most people, though, uh, we end up, the, the round implant generally tends to be a really good choice. Why is that? Well, it's been around for a long time, uh, and most people are able to achieve a really pretty look. To, then it comes down to picking the right implant. So we can, you know, there's a lot of different techniques that we use to assess somebody to figure out what's the perfect implant. Because at the end of the day, most people are coming in, their main concern is, how do I find that perfect implant which gives me the look that I want? And right. Dr. Gown can really talk to you about how we do that. Now, some, I'm sorry, sometimes we tend to associate, you know, the, having the nice big brown breasts for people who are, you know, kind of arm candy wives, so to say. Is it really affordable? Is it not affordable? Can it just be for the average woman, you know, goes to church on Sundays? Absolutely. It's an absolutely affordable procedure. It's very safe. It's very quick. There's quick recovery. And nowadays we have the advantage of an entire slew of different devices that are customized to each individual patient. In the past, we used to have three choices for breast augmentation, small, medium, large. Now we measure base diameter, we measure how much projection the woman wants, and we use a lot of uh, trying on the implants with sizing bras and now 3D technology as well, where we take a picture of the patient, mm -hmm. we rotate that in three-dimensional space on the computer, and we have every different style, shape, size, variety of implant, and you can preview what you're gonna look like with different sized implants. Wow. And this is an extremely powerful tool. And that oftentimes guides the choice of, do you want an overly augmented look? Do you want a more softer, natural look? Do you want to maintain a sporty look? Or do you want to go very large in size? So would you say for, in terms of health and aesthetics, is there a perfect size? I don't a think cup. It, How about, is there a perfect cup? You know, it's interesting. I think that in, as it relates to, to health, I don't think so. I think that the a different size makes sense for different builds and for different desires. So. Like Dr. Gown was saying, there's some people who want a very athletic look. They don't want to be overly large. They want to be able to participate in sports without their breast implants hindering them. For other people, maybe they're not as active. They're, they're, they, they do something else with their lives where they want more attention. They want a, a larger size. The size isn't really going to impact the health. It's really more of an issue of trying to pick the right size to deliver the goal for that particular patient. What would be the um, average recovery time for augmentation? I've had patients who've gone out dancing by the end of the week and some there's still a little bit sore by the end of week two. But again, it's not something that's going to take you out of your life to where you have to take weeks and weeks off of work before going back and enjoying the activities you like most. Okay, well thank you Dr. Gowan, thank you Dr. West. If you'd like more information, please check out their website at finesseplasticsurgery.com. We'll be back with Everyday Fitness. Are you in every way woman? You in every way, woman. Have you ever read a food label, but you get all confused with all the numbers? We have Alicia here that's going to explain how to read them. How do you read them? <laughs> oh, how do I read them? I look <laughs> at a food label, and sometimes I'm overwhelmed, and I actually know what's in there. Um, what's the first thing you look at on a food label? Oh, my God. I am so embarrassed to even admit it. Calories. And I know I'm probably wrong, huh? Calories. Calories, uh, There is yeah. no real wrong answer. Uh, I, personally, I like to scroll all the way down. Don't you ever want to skip to the end of the book? 
I like to scroll all the way down and look at the ingredients. Uh -huh. I want to know what's in my food. So what's the, it's, it's listed by quantity. So whatever shows up first on the ingredient list is what there is a lot of in the food. Mm -hmm. and, and then as it goes, it's, the quantity is lower and lower and lower. Mm -hmm. So you want to know what's in your food. If the first ingredient in there is something you cannot pronounce or it's foreign Which to half you, of them are. <laughs> there you go. I say skip it. <laughs> skip it. If the first ingredient is something you semi-recognize, uh -huh. go for it. I like to also stay with something that has less than at least 10 ingredients. If it's five ingredients, you're solid. So that's the first thing. Um, next thing I look at is probably the um, uh, serving size. Oh my God, talking about serving size, um, yeah. I hate it when they, you know, I go buy at the grocery store a cupcake, for example, mm -hmm. and they tell you serving size for it. I'm looking at it, I can eat the whole damn cupcake, you know? So like, And a few more, right? Yeah, and a few more. So how do you read that? So serving size is actually really important to look at on a nutrition, um, uh, to the facts. Uh, it's important to know how much of it is a serving size. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, a can of Coke is two and a half servings. Do you share your Coke with two and a half people? No, probably not, right? <laughs> I gotta think uh, about it. <laughs> so yeah, serving size is important to look at. Like a bag of chips is about 10 servings. Uh, so how do you separate those <laughs> <laughs> you just want to look at it and make sure. So if you look at it and it says, okay, it's two and a half servings, you got to look at that cat co Coke can and say, okay, I can only drink about like a fourth of this, maybe close to half or half. And that's what's going to give you the whatever thing. You know, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because, for example, let's go back to the bag of chips and it says, <laughs> you know, it feeds 10 or servings uh -huh. 10, but you eat the whole bag. How much do you gain? <laughs> um, that's I mean, like a good... <laughs> Do you like that? thousand calories or so, right? Yeah. I oh mean, if you God. look at the calories, it's, no it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, okay, let's go to the apples. For example, the apples, each apple has like a little sticker. What are those stickers you Oh, I'm really glad you brought that up. That's actually something clients ask me about all the time. Uh, when you buy your fruits and vegetables, they have stickers on them, and each one is a different code. If the code starts with a nine and it's a five-digit code, it's organic. If it starts oh. with a three or four, it's conventional, which means it may have been treated with pesticides, may not have and then if it starts with a uh eight and it's a five digit code then it's genetically modified so it's a gmo what's pesticides sorry pesticides, I know that's a dumb question. <laughs> pesticides are um, chemicals that they use to keep flies away from the fruits and vegetables Ew. but at the same time there there's something that we ingest and that's something that you can never get rid of so you can't detox that out of your body it's once it's in your body it's in your body for good so and what's that organic other word that you said. Sorry, I can't pronounce Organic. It. So organic. If it's uh, if it starts with a nine and it's organic, um, you know it's locally or hopefully it's locally, but it's it's produce. It's that's more been, produced. Yeah, and they it's don't made. use herbicides, pesticides, and and all of those chemicals. What advice would you give me, for example, like shopping? You know, when I'm trying to lose weight, because I'm always like in the verge of trying to lose weight. What should I look at in a label? So I would, like I said, we'll stick to three. I would look at the ingredients first, see if you can get the one with least amount of ingredients. And then the second thing I would look at is the serving size. And then maybe I'll look at the sugar. Serving, serving size and sugar. That's easy enough, right? Okay, so not fat? Not necessarily because sometimes when the fat content is high, it's actually a good thing. Like if you're looking at nuts and the fat content is high on there, it's good fat. So you don't want to get rid of it just because the label says it's high fat. doesn't mean you should get rid of it. I have a perfect question though. Because I know it. like when I go to the doctor, a lot of people, you know, they, the doctor says, watch your sodium. What is sodium? Okay, that's, that's another good question. <laughs> so sodium actually helps with fluid retention. Um, so when we hold on to our water weight, it's water usually because weight. of sodium. Um, mm -hmm. And you want to pick foods that are lower in sodium. It helps reduce that water retention and drink lots of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need that. Milk. What about milk? Milk. The food labels. Oh, okay, so if you remember a long time ago, we had this issue with RBST and hormones in the milk. So nowadays, if you buy milk, there's a little logo on it that says RBST free, which means the cows were not treated with hormones. Yay for us, right? Okay, okay, okay. And if, if they were treated? Uh, we don't want to drink that milk, <sighs> which is why. There you have it. That was my 101 class for nutrition food labels. labels. <laughs> for food labels. I hope this was very informational for you and we will be right back. I'm an everyday woman, woman, woman in every way, yeah, yeah. I'm living my life, 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 living
living day by day. Yeah, yeah. Are you in every way, woman?